Auscultation of heart sounds is especially challenging for critical care nurses because proficiency in identifying abnormal heart sounds require practice, practice, and lots of practice. Auscultation of heart sounds provides vital diagnostic clues to many cardiac abnormalities. In this segment of the critical care course, I will review with you tips on how to develop skill in identifying normal and selected abnormal heart sounds. Cardiac auscultation is extremely difficult for nurses because our ears are not used to the unusual vibration sounds heard when auscultating the heart and because we now rely more on other advanced technology to identify abnormalities of sounds generated by the heart like phonocardiograms and echocardiograms. A key to developing the proficiency in cardiac auscultation is having the right equipment, using it properly and concentrating on selected portions of the cardiac cycle. Let me re-emphasize clinical pearls pertaining to this stethoscope, which we covered earlier in lung sounds. Let me remind you to some of them. 1. Be sure to use both the diaphragm and the bell during auscultation. To appreciate the high-pitched components of the first and second heart sounds, the diaphragm of the stethoscope should be applied with sufficient pressure to leave a mark or an after ring on the chest when it is removed. Second, the bell should be used slightly, applying gentle pressure only to make a seal with the skin. Pressing it with much pressure stretches the skin and converts the bell into a diaphragm. The bell is best to detect low-frequency gallop sounds of S3 and S4. Third, resist the temptation to examine for heart sounds through clothing. For maximal auscultatory appreciation of sounds, the stethoscope should be in contact with the patient's skin. Learning the correct technique for auscultation is essential in order to distinguish the normal from the pathologic. It is important to memorize the anatomical landmarks where the stethoscope should be placed on the patient's chest. Remember these anatomical sites where you should auscultate and the corresponding anatomical and physiological significance to the heart sounds they represent. All cardiac areas must be auscultated in a structured and methodical fashion. Inch your stethoscope to all the areas. Listen for at least five seconds while the patient is breathing normally. This requirement is probably one of the most common omissions and pitfalls during the physical examination. Always allow adequate time to listen to the heart sounds. So let us review the anatomical sites where one should auscultate when performing a cardiac examination. Let us review the auscultation surface landmarks or listening posts. First, the aortic area. Place the diaphragm of the stethoscope at the second intercostal space, right sternal edge. This is the anatomical landmark for the aortic valve. Listen for at least five seconds for the second heart sound, which represents the aortic valve closing. Loud S2 in this area may indicate systemic hypertension. Pulmonic area. Place the diaphragm of the stethoscope at the second intercostal space, left sternal edge. This is the anatomical landmark for the pulmonary valve. Listen for at least five seconds for the second heart sound, which represents the pulmonary valve closing. Loud S2 in this area may correlate with increased pulmonary artery pressure, such as what can be observed in patients with COPD. Tricuspid area. Place the diaphragm of the stethoscope at the fourth and fifth intercostal space, left sternal edge. This is the anatomical landmark for the tricuspid valve. Listen for at least five seconds for the first heart sound, which represents the tricuspid valve closing. Mitral area. Place the diaphragm of the stethoscope at the fifth intercostal space, mid-clavicular line. This is the same area as the apical beat or apical heartbeat. This is the anatomical landmark for the mitral valve. 
Listen for at least five seconds for the first heart sound, which represents the mitral valve closing. This location is where you need to concentrate for the presence of gallops, particularly as the patient assumes a left lateral side-lying position. When listening to a patient's heart, the cadence of the beat will usually distinguish S1 from S2. Because diastole takes about twice as long as systole, there is a longer pause between S2 and S1 than there is between S1 and S2. Now, sometimes the rapid heart rates can shorten diastole to the point where it is difficult to discern which is S1 and which is S2. That's always confusing. We always want to know which one is S1 and which one is S2. For this reason, it is important to always palpate the point of maximal impulse or the carotid pulse when auscultating. The heart sound that you hear when you first feel the pulse is S1. And when the pulse disappears, it is S2. It is important that you always palpate either the PMI or the point of maximal impulse or the carotid pulse when auscultating. The heart sound that you hear when you first feel the pulse is S1. So now you've listened to the lung, the, the heart sounds, I should say. The physical findings should be interpreted with respect to their intensity, pitch, location, quality, and timing in the cardiac cycle. So what exactly in intensity are we looking for? Well, heart sounds can be described as increase in intensity or louder, or decrease in intensity or softer or absent. Pitch. Heart sounds can be described as high pitch, which are heard best with the diaphragm of the stethoscope, or low pitched. Location. The location of the heart sound can help determine the etiology. The standard listening posts, which are the aortic, the pulmonic, the tricuspid, and the mitral, apply to both heart sounds as well as murmurs. For example, the S1 heart sound, consisting of mitral and tricuspid valve closure, is bird best heard at the tricuspid or left sternal border and the mitral or the cardiac apex listening posts. Look at the diagram. Timing. The timing can be described as during early or perhaps mid or perhaps late systole or early mid or late diastole. The examination should be conducted in a warm, quiet room. Place the patient in a supine position after all clothing has been removed from the chest. Explain to the patient that you're going to examine the heart. Warm your hands and stethoscope, but warn the patient that your hands may be cool at first. The most comfortable and satisfactory position for most examiners is on the patient's right side. The auscultatory examination is commonly began at the aortic area. Look at the arrow. It's on the second right intercostal space. And the stethoscope is inched to the pulmonary area. Look at the arrow on the second left intercostal space. Then the tricuspid area on the loft, lower left sternal border. And the mitral area, which is the cardiac apex. Follow an identical routine for every examination, passing from one part to another in a particular order. For me as a clinician, I always start with my diaphragm, inching from the aortic onto the pulmonic to the tricuspid and then into the mitral listening post. And then I reverse the procedure using the bell this time from the apex going back to the tricuspid listening post, then to the pulmonic, and then into the aortic listening post. Traditionally, you might have been taught that you perform auscultation over the four areas of the precordium that roughly corresponds perhaps to the location, quote unquote, of the four valves of the heart. This leads to some misperceptions. I want you to know that valves are not strictly located in these areas, nor are the sounds created by valvular pathology restricted to those spaces. So while it might be okay to listen in just four places when conducting the normal exam, 
it is quite helpful actually to listen in many more when there is an, any abnormal uh, abnormalities or abnormal sounds uh, that you hear. Normal heart sounds will differ considerably in various chest wall locations and patient positions. In the region of the apex, for example, heart sounds are usually loud, and that is because the heart is in direct contact with the anterior wall of the thorax. However, in patients who are big or have thick chest walls, or perhaps they have COPD and barrel chest, heart sounds may be poorly heard or inaudible. However, they are heard more clearly if the patient bends forward or lies on the left side and is examined at the point of maximal expiration. I realize that this might not be possible in critical care patients. But wherever you can and whenever can, patients can tolerate it, you should. In young persons with thin and elastic chest, well, this is very great because heart sounds are heard with greater intensity than in older patients whose chest walls are thicker and stiffer. Let's now discuss the first heart sound. The first heart sound, or S1, occurs as the mitral and tricuspid valves close after blood enters the ventricles, representing the start of systole. When the two ventricles contract and pump out blood into the aorta and pulmonary artery, the mitral and tricuspid valves close to prevent the blood flowing back into the atria. The first sound, S1, is generated by vibrations created by the closing of these two valves. Mitral valve closure, usually when we talk about heart sounds, we term that as M1, precedes tricuspid valve closure, which would be termed T1, causing a slight split. The M1, or the mitral valve closure, the sound is much louder than T1 or the tricuspid valve closure due to higher pressures in the left side of the heart. Thus, M1 radiates to all cardiac listening areas. This makes the M1 or mitral valve closure mostly the main component of what you hear when you're listening to S1. Now again, the first heart sound is synchronous with the outward thrust of the apical impulse. So, with experience, it is possible for you to watch the movement of the stethoscope on the chest while listening to the heart sounds in order to time systole and diastole. When the apex, uh, apical impulse cannot be seen or the pulsation of the carotid artery can be used also as a guide. A finger on the carotid artery can sense the palpable arterial upstroke that immediately follows the first heart sound. Do not use a more distant artery for this purpose, by the way, because it leads to error, because it will take a long time for the pulse wave to reach the peripheral area. So what abnormalities would you suspect when there are soft or loud S1? Well, we will not be dealing with those here, but it is worth mentioning that louder S1 may be heard heard when there is a short PR interval and a faint S1, on the other hand, will be noticeable in instances where there is a long PR interval. The loud S1 when there is a short PR interval is due to the valve leaflets being in a wide open position in the onset of ventricular contraction and therefore closing more forcefully. The second heart sound. After pumping the blood, the ventricles relax to receive blood from the atria and the diastole phase begins. The second heart sound, or S2, as we would refer it, occurs when the aortic and pulmonary valves, also known as the semilunar valves, close after blood has left the ventricles to enter the systemic and pulmonary circulation at the end of systole, at the beginning of isovolumetric ventricular relaxation. Now, S2 is physiologically split because aortic valve closure normally precedes pulmonic valve closure. This splitting changes depending on respiration, body posture, and certain pathological conditions. The sound produced by the closure of the aortic valve is termed A2 in auscultation terminology, 
and the sound produced by the closure of the pulmonic valve is termed P2. So you always hear people refer to the second heart sound as A2P2, while first heart sound is always referred to as T1M1. The A2 sound is normally much louder than the P2. Why again? Because there is higher pressures in the left side of the heart. Thus, A2 radiates to all cardiac listening areas, which is loudest at the right upper sternal border. And P2 is usually only heard at the left upper sternal border. Therefore, when you're listening to the second heart sound, the A2 or the aortic sound is the main component that you hear. Now, although S1 and S2 are considered to be separate or discrete sounds, you will notice that each is created by the near instantaneous closing of two separate valves. Let us now listen to a normal S1 and S2. third heart sound. The third heart sound, also known as ventricular gallop, occurs just after S2 when the mitral valve opens, allowing passive filling of the left ventricle. Now, shortly after S2, the closing of the semilunar valves or the pulmonic and aortic valves, the AV valves open and diastole begins. When we talk about diastole, diastole is itself further divided into stages. The first being that of rapid filling, where 80% of the blood stored in the atria during systole is transferred to the ventricles. At the end of this stage, about a few milliseconds after S2, an S3 may be heard if the volume which has been transferred is abnormally large. This large volume causes tensing of the chordae tendini and the AV ring or the atrioventricular ring. This corresponds to the rapid rush of blood from the atrium into the ventricles as it starts relaxing. It can be thought of as a sound which is generated when the ventricle is forced to dilate beyond its normal range because the atrium has an overloaded volume. S3 then is caused by a sudden deceleration of blood flow into the left ventricle from the left atrium. An S3 is normal in a healthy child or young adult, an athlete, or somebody who is in the third trimester of pregnancy. It decreases with age as the ventricles become less compliant and usually disappears by 20 to 30 years except those in good athletic shape. S3 is often associated with ventricular dilatation, like what happens in systolic ventricular failure. In older individuals, it indicates the presence of congestive heart failure, which is the most common cause of an S3. It may also be associated with dilated cardiomyopathy, with dilated ventricles, which contribute to the sound. S3 is best heard with the bell of the stethoscope pressed lightly on the skin of the chest. An S3 sound should disappear when the diaphragm of the stethoscope is used and could be appreciated when using the bell. It is best heard at the apex of the left lateral decubitide position. Most S3 gallops are usually heard every third or fourth beat rather than with every beat, unlike S4, which is usually heard every beat. Now, you might have heard things that would make it easier for you to remember how this sounds like. As similar to pronouncing the word Kentucky, with the S1 being the can, the S2 being the tuck, and the S3 being the E. Well, another good mnemonic to remember, the cadence and underlying pathology of an S3 is slushing in, slushing in, slushing in, slush, 
represents S1, ing represents S2, and in represents S3. Try to repeat the above phrase in time to the rhythm that you hear now. S4. The ventricles filling with blood occurs in two distinct phases. One passively, which consists of 80% of the ventricular load, and the other is through atrial contraction, also known as atrial kick, which contributes to 20% of the ventricular load. The fourth heart sound, when audible, is caused by vibration of the ventricular wall during atrial contraction. The late stage of diastole is marked by atrial contraction or kick, where the final 20% of the atrial output is delivered to the ventus. If the ventricle is stiff and non-compliant, the pressure wave generated as the atria contract produces an S4. It reflects a lack of ventricular compliance, which necessitates a more forceful atrial contraction for completion of ventricular filling. This sound is usually associated with a stiffened ventricle or low ventricular compliance and therefore is heard in patients with ventricular hypertrophy, myocardial ischemia, or in older adults. The stiffness of the left ventricle may be due to scar tissue formation. It may also be a manifestation of coronary heart disease and is a hallmark of myocardial infarction. A fourth heart sound can also be caused by a greatly thickened left ventricle wall, such as what happens with essential hypertension or aortic stenosis. Since S4 relies on atrial contraction, it is not present during atrial fibrillation. The fourth heart sound is a low-frequency sound, best heard with the bell of the stethoscope pressed lightly on the skin of the chest. And what does it sound like? It is remembered with the pronunciation of the word Tennessee. This is how I've been taught with the S4 being the tin, the S1 being the nest, and the S2 being the C. Another good mnemonic to remember, the cadence and the pathology of an S4 is a stiff wall, a stiff wall, a stiff wall. A being S4, stiff being S1, and wall being S2. Practice saying a stiff wall, a stiff wall, aloud as you listen to this with. Here is S4. Murmurs. A heart murmur is a very general term used to describe abnormal sounds because of turbulent or rapid blood flow through the heart, the great blood vessels, or disease or healthy heart valves. Murmurs can also be caused by the forward flow of blood across a constricted or otherwise irregular valve or into a dilated heart chamber or dilated vessel. A sudden onset of murmur can indicate heart failure, shock, or a ruptured papillary mass. And this is one reason why nurses in critical care must learn how to recognize the presence of a murmur. Note then that a sudden occurrence of a murmur is not a good sign. If you hear a murmur, ask yourself. Does it occur during systole or diastole? The carotid upstroke or the apical impulse should be used to time the murmurs to decide if they are systolic or diastolic. What is the quality of the sound? Does it get louder than softer? Does it maintain the same intensity throughout? Does it start out loud and then become soft? Sometimes it might help for you to draw a pictorial representation of the sound. What is the quantity of the sound? The rating system for a murmur is displayed on the slide. 1 over 6 can only be heard with careful listening. Louder murmurs generally, but not always, indicates greater pathology. Let's now listen to a murmur. 
That ends our presentation on heart sounds. My advice to you is to practice listening to all the sounds in order to gain expertise in the interpretation of these sounds. Thank you for your participation.